I mentioned in first service that uh, at this point I should just say and go in peace. God bless you. Have a wonderful day uh, because that may be exactly what you needed to hear this morning. And, and so uh, we're just so thankful that Susan shared. Uh, if, uh, if, if I still can have a few minutes of your attention, I invite you to, to turn to the book of Philemon. Actually, it's a very short letter. Uh, it is, if you can find in the New Testament, the, really the second uh, half of Scripture, some books that start with the letter T, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, and before you get to another large book of Hebrews, there's 25 verses tucked in there, and it's a letter that Paul wrote to an individual. The letters that we have from Paul are written to churches, so groups of people. Paul decided it was important to tar- write a letter to Philemon. Now, for as much as we know about Philemon, Philemon was a very successful businessman. He uh, also had a church in his home, so he led the church in his home. And he also had slaves, which was common in that day. And one of his slaves is named Onesimus. And Onesimus ran away to Rome, and he encountered and he met Paul, the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter. And Paul writes this letter on behalf of Onesimus because Onesimus receives Jesus, starts following Jesus. Paul is discipling him. And Onesimus feels it's important to go back to Philemon to make things right because he ran away. And Paul, he sends this letter. And he says, my friend Philemon, I want you to receive Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a brother. There's been a transformation that has taken place. And so he writes this letter, this change that's occurred. And what I want us to do here today is to understand the heart of what Paul is writing to Philemon and what it has to do with prayer and fasting. What Susan said earlier is a beautiful um, parallel to where we're at with Philemon. So in Philemon, starting in verse 4, it says this. Um, It says, "I, I always thank my God as I remember you, talking to Philemon, in my prayers. So Paul is saying, I remember you, Philemon, in my prayers. Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So it begins with gratitude. And what he's saying is you love people, Philemon, you love Jesus, you have great faith in Jesus. But what he says is in verse six, he says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding. Now that's from the NIV. And if you read that, you, you miss really the heart, or you can miss the heart. And so there's a couple other translations I wanted to briefly share with what Paul is trying to communicate. And out of the ESV, it says, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. The CEV says, as you share your faith with others, I pray that they may come to know the blessings Christ has given us. And the RSV, it says, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. So what Paul is saying here to Philemon at the beginning of this letter is, I'm praying for you, You love people, you love Jesus, and so what I want you to do is I want you to know Jesus more, and as you know Jesus more, I want you to share your faith. This is what I want you to do. And he goes on to say that he's refreshed by Philemon's faith. But as I read this again this week and thinking of this interaction, I had a question that came to mind. Is that Onesimus lived within the household of Philemon, who led a church, who loved Jesus, who loved people, but Onesimus ran away. He went to Paul, and he met Jesus when he interacted with Paul. Why did Onesimus not know Jesus sooner? Why did he not meet him sooner? Why did he not respond earlier in faith? And there's no way we can answer that question. We don't know, but it causes me to ask the question of myself, too, is that when I'm praying, when I'm walking throughout my week, when I'm interacting with people, am I like Philemon and are there Onesimuses around me that are close in my household, in my neighborhood, in my school, in my workplace, in wherever I go, that there are people that may know I have faith, that may see me love people, but the Onesimuses around us are not responding in faith for whatever reason that may be. It's a little bit of a gut check of of who is that that's right near me. And what is my response to them? What is my, my call to them? Because what Paul was doing is he was 
writing to Philemon and saying, hey, know Jesus better. And when you know Jesus better, you're going to share Jesus more freely. And when you share Jesus more freely, you're going to know Jesus better. And then when you know Jesus better, you're going to share Jesus more freely. And then you're going to know Jesus better and you're going to share more freely, right? It's like this encouraging cycle that's going on. Because we're called to go and to make disciples, to teach, to baptize. This is a great commission that Jesus gave to all of his disciples. We're not called just to say, okay, I've got my word and I got my Jesus and I'm all good. Someone once said that when you receive Jesus, that, that it ceases to become really focused on you, that it starts to focus on others. We have to look beyond ourselves as soon as we say yes to following Jesus. We're called out. We're called to take the message of Jesus to the world around us everywhere we go. We're not called to exist in Christian bubbles or Christian subcultures or be tucked away or hidden away. Jesus says we're to be the light of the world. We're to be salt of the earth. We're to make a difference because of Jesus in us. There's a rhythm that I've found in my life that I go back and forth, and maybe you can relate, is that I'll find myself in a low moment, or I'll find myself feeling spiritually dry or empty or just bored with faith. Can I say that out loud? Can I say the bored with faith? Is that allowed? But what I often have to realize in that moment is that I've made faith about me. I've made it about my own well-being, my own good, my own whatever, and I start getting very insular and everything, and, and I've stopped connecting in community. I've stopped encouraging others. I've stopped praying for others. I've stopped sharing Jesus. Is that that stuff is what energizes me. That stuff is what propels me forward, is when I better know Jesus, then I'm more freely to share, and when I'm more freely to share, then I know Jesus better, and back and forth and back and forth. See, Jesus called us to be baptized as an outward sign of an inward change. And yes, it is for each one of us to make that public proclamation, but guess what happens? When someone is baptized, we're all encouraged. When someone receives Christ or when someone starts walking with Jesus that wasn't, and we have this tree up here, and when they turn a bulb, yeah, it's for someone to take a step and publicly profess Christ, but it's an encouragement to all of us. Or if you've been walking with someone, praying for someone, and you see this growth, you see this step, you see this maturity, it is encouragement. Scripture teaches us in Revelation, uh, it talks about uh, we will overcome, or they triumphed over the enemy for, because of two things. They overcame by the, the blood of the lamb and the power of the testimony. They triumphed over him, being the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did on the cross, and the word of the testimony. So Jesus has already done his work on the cross. Now it's Susans of the world. It's you sharing testimony of what God has done in you that overcomes. We're encouraged. And so today, just in a few moments that we have left, I want to fly through four encouragements of how you can share your faith, how you can share Jesus. Often what happens in these times is we go to guilt and shame, and we're like, oh, no, I don't know, I don't know enough. It's not about knowing enough. It's about responding, being alert and aware to what Jesus is doing in us. And the four things I want to share is, I came across this a while ago, is Pastor Craig Rochelle. He shared this with his readers and with his church of four ways that they could share. And I just, I want to repeat these to you. First thing is be loving and direct. Now, often we can think of being direct because we've all been yelled at by someone, maybe with a sign or a megaphone or whatever, that we are sinners and we need to repent. But we can be loving and direct. Often what we want to do is just hide back and be like, well, they will see my kindness and they will know Jesus and they will walk with Jesus. Maybe. But words are very important. In Romans, it says this, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one that they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? So what Paul's saying here in Romans is like, you got, you got to use words. Words are important. Words communicate. And so this can take a lot of different approaches. To be loving and direct, yeah, you can stand on the street corner and yell at people. Or you can sit across a table or in a car, and you can speak very lovingly and direct. One of the things that Peter said in Acts is he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name 
of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So when we're being loving and direct, it is not just be a better person. It is, we need to repent. There's a turn, there's a change, there's a confession. We're all sinners. And we've been saved by faith. It's, it's by grace we've been saved. That Ephesians passage that Chris read. So words are necessary. So one way that you can share your faith is to be very loving and direct. Please don't yell at people. Please don't. Be loving and direct. The second thing, the second way that you can share is to share your story. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have a story. In John 9, Jesus is walking with his disciples and they come across a man who's born blind and Jesus heals this man and everyone in the the town is trying to figure out how he was healed and the Pharisees get involved and the man who is blind, his parents get involved and they go to the man and they're like, how did this happen? He says, one thing I know is I was blind, but now I see. Like He's like, I don't know how this happened. I don't know what was going on, but I was blind and now I can see. What is it in your story that you were and you now are? Who were you before Jesus and who are you now? I was this and now I'm this. For me, fear has been at the root of my reality for much of my life. When I was a little kid, when I received Jesus for the first time, it was because I was afraid. There was a thunderstorm. That was the root. Throughout life, fear has just popped up its head so many different times in so many different ways. And so for me, it was like I was afraid. And and still, when I am afraid, I go to Jesus. I trust in Jesus. He is my strength. He's my rock. He's my shelter. He's my stronghold. What about for you? Who were you And what are you now? The man in John 9, I was blind, but now I see. So you can be loving and direct, and you can also share your story. The third thing is you can invite. You can invite. Now, you've all gone places that you would never step foot into unless you were invited. For some of you, you have zero interest in sports, But because someone invited you, you went and you saw maybe a loved one compete or some sort of event. Or maybe you have zero interest in the arts and dance and theater and whatever it may be. But someone invited you and you went. Invitations are powerful. So what does it look like to invite someone to church or to an event? Now there are thousands of people just in Marshall that did not go to church today. And it's not necessarily because they're against church. That's a very, very small percentage that studies show or against Jesus or against Christians or whatever. It's tiny. The people that sat at home today just are indifferent. For most, it didn't even cross the mind. Just like you going to that sporting event or you to that production of whatever it is. You just wouldn't have gone unless you're invited. There's power in an invite here to church or to an event. Yesterday, there was a a women's tea. There's a lot of women there, but there's still room for more. Prime timers have events. Are you inviting people? There's still green chairs scattered amongst here that are empty. Are we inviting people? You have some friends that get together or a small group or you go get coffee. Are you inviting people to come along? In John 4, there's a woman that Jesus meets at the well. They have this great interaction. She leaves, goes back to her town, and she says, I met this person named Jesus. He told me all about my life. Come and see this man that I've met. She went back because she cared because she was invested, she knew them, and she said, come and see Jesus. Invitations are powerful, and it does not have to be to a Sunday morning. There's all sorts of opportunities that you can invite. Come and see this person that's changed your life. And then the last one is, what if we live a life that others want? In Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're singing and praying in prison. And the jailers and the other prisoners are like, this doesn't normally happen. And then there's an earthquake. And the jailer anticipates everyone running out because the doors are broken down, it says. 
And the jailer's like, if anyone escapes, I'm going to be killed. So he goes to kill himself. And Paul and Silas are like, hold on, hold on, we're all here. We're all here. Wait. And the jailer responds by saying, what must I do to be saved? The jailer witnessed their actions. He's like, there's something different. And I wonder what kind of faith I'm living out. What kind of Jesus I'm presenting. Do I walk with peace? Do I walk with joy? Do I walk with kindness? Do I walk with care? Do I walk with compassion? What am I living out? We've all been around people who have faced disease, who have faced sickness, and they have this strong faith, and you're like, wow, there's something going on. We've been around people who are encouragers in hard seasons of life. You're like, how are you encouraging me right now? We've been around people who just have joy exude out of them. Like, I want that. Like the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Now, I'm working on a theory that I want to share very briefly here. And you can push back on this theory. Uh, Is that I have a theory that your impact when it comes to sharing Jesus is greater than mine. Now, you may say, wait, 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 you have a microphone, you're standing in front of us, whomever is watching online, it gets repeated on social media. Oh, true. But here's, here's what I'm working on here. Is, could we have that list back up? Being loving and direct. When I share Jesus, it's expected, right? I get paid to share Jesus. So when I do that, it's like, yeah, all right, yep, he did that. When you share Jesus, someone goes, huh. No matter, even if they reject you, which many, many times does not happen, when you're loving and direct, there's a different level of sincerity coming from you. It doesn't mean I'm insincere, but there's a different level of authenticity and sincerity that comes from you. When you share your story When you share what Jesus has done, this is the way I was and this is the way I am, you're giving of yourself. Now, I'm doing the same thing when I'm sharing about fear, but again, it fits the narrative. You're the pastor. It fits your narrative you're trying to work within. When I invite someone to church, it can be kind of weird. Hey, come hear me speak for a half an hour. It's great. Yes, I'm still called to be loving and direct, still called to share my story, still called to invite. But when you invite, someone's like, oh, hmm, they care about me. They want me to be a part of whatever this important thing is in their life. And then we're all called to live this life that others want. That's just a theory I'm working on. And it does not excuse me, but I think it multiplies your impact, which can feel small. So many times it's like, I'm not equipped, I'm not... I can't do this. I don't know what I'm doing. But your sphere of influence is huge. You love people and people love you that could care less about me. You have great opportunity to speak into so many people. And the numbers are amazing. Is the impact that each one of you have each and every week to multiply. I mean, yeah, there's there's a couple hundred people that gather here every Sunday morning but it's thousands of people that we reach as a church because of you every day of the week. So what happens if I were to become aware and alert and attentive this week as I pray and I fast and I walk through about opportunities to be loving and direct, to share my story, to invite, to live a life that others want? And this is my encouragement and my challenge to you this week, is that as you pray, as you fast, that you would be even more attentive to those around you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for everyone to know Jesus, that no one would perish. We don't have to stand up and preach. We don't have to yell. We get to invest life on life. And so I'm going to pray in just a moment. What I'm going to pray for is that God would reveal opportunities to us and he would give us all sorts of opportunities. And guess what? God is faithful and there are going to be opportunities like crazy as soon as you leave here. 
And we're all gonna make decisions throughout the week, whether to engage in the conversations or the opportunities. Some we're just gonna miss and we're like, oh! Others we're gonna ignore. Others we're gonna engage in. But it's about becoming aware and attentive and sharing that love of Christ in whatever way is presented before us. So I invite you to pray with me. Jesus, we thank you that you know us, that you love us, that you care for us, that you did not intend for us just to be stagnant and stale and bored and repetitive in faith, but rather like the words that Paul wrote to Philemon, you want us to know you and you want us to be active in sharing our faith. And so, Father, I pray for just a life like no other that comes alive, fed by your Holy Spirit as we walk this week. Yes, Jesus, drive us into your word, drive us into prayer, into fasting, but God, move us in mighty ways in all the places that we go. God, starting today, we pray for those opportunities, those conversations, those connections, Lord, that you have already ordained, you've set in motion, and God, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would give us the words to say. We would trust you. We would lean into you. God, we thank you that <coughs> you care for us. God, I pray for anyone here today who's not said yes to you. We're talking about multiplying into others, but, but the starting point is saying yes to you. And for anyone here, that today they can put their faith and their trust in you. Because you are a God who forgives all of our sin. By grace, we're saved. And so if that's you here today, just within your heart, within your heart and mind, you can pray this to God as Heavenly Father. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new. Believe Jesus died for me so I could live for you. And so today, I trust you with my whole life. Fill me with your spirit so that I can know you, serve you, and follow you. My life is not my own. Give it to you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.